Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to this webinar in our series of annual LGA conference webinars taking place this week and next. I'm Councillor Ruth Dombey. I'm the deputy leader of the LGA's Liberal Democrat group and I'm the leader of Sutton Council. Um, before we hear from Ed, I'd just like to uh, mention a couple of quick points. So first of all, this webinar is being recorded. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please do use the Q&A function. And there's also an upvote function where you can indicate which questions you'd like to hear answered. I'd like to thank our sponsors, CCLA, for their support in helping us put on these series of webinars. And I'm really delighted to welcome Ed Davey to our virtual conference. Um, as many of you know, Ed is acting leader of the Liberal Democrats and the MP for Kingston and Surbiton. I don't know if I've ever told you, Ed, but I actually grew up in your constituency. My first paid job was in Woolworths in Kingston Market Square, so right. I know the area very well. And I believe I'm welcoming you back um, to our LGA conference because you've spoken before when you were Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. Ed's been the Member of Parliament for Kingston Surbiton for over 22 years, with just the slightest little bit gap during those 22 years. And during his time, he worked closely with both Paddy Ashdown and Charles Kennedy. Ed's a trained economist and he became the leader's economics advisor. Um, he then held a range of spokespersons roles in Parliament, including the housing and local government spokesman, and has a strong background in local government. And then, as I've said, became Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. As the acting leader of the Liberal Democrats, Ed was in fact the first leader to call for a public inquiry into the government's handling of the COVID-19 crisis. And he's always been a vocal advocate for the local government sector, both before and during the crisis. So I'm really pleased to welcome Ed to this conference and to invite him to speak to us for a short period. Ed, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ruth, and good morning to everybody. It's great to be with you today, albeit virtually. And can I say thank you to the LGA for inviting me to speak about the crucial role of local government, not just in keeping our communities safe during this coronavirus pandemic, but also in building the fairer, greener, more prosperous country we all want to see emerge from this crisis. It's a great shame not to be joining you in Harrogate, uh, but I hope you're all keeping well and safe during these, these very difficult times. I actually want to start by saying a huge thank you. Thank you to all of you for everything you are doing as councillors and council officers, especially right now. Even as COVID has caused unbearable heartbreak and hardship, it's been truly uplifting to see the great work councils right across the country are doing to support local people. Here in Kingston, I've been enormously proud of the work our Liberal Democrat Council has done to get laptops to disadvantaged children so they can continue to learn and to get food parcels to vulnerable people so they can stay safe at home. I'm proud too of the work of so many other Liberal Democrat councils and councillors, uh, the work you've done in your communities. You know, like South Cambridgeshire Council, supporting volunteer schemes in every village and town in their district and setting up three hot meal schemes for people unable to access uh, meals at schools or day centres. South Lakeland District Council delivering free sanitary products to dozens of pickup points to make sure the fight against period poverty doesn't go backwards while schools are closed. And I know so many councils in all parts of our country have performed similar feats, whether it's getting homeless people off the streets and into accommodation, or getting protective equipment to social care staff when the government had let them down so badly. And doing all that while making sure our bins still get emptied, our waste still gets recycled and our buses are still running. Even though coronavirus has made all that work so much harder. For me, this pandemic has highlighted something Liberal Democrats have always understood. Local authorities are the key institutions that enable our communities to come together and deliver the vital services people need. That's true in normal times and it's even more important in a crisis like this. It sadly, doesn't seem this Conservative government really understands this and gets it. The sums of money ministers have announced for councils fall embarrassingly far short of what local authorities need to weather this crisis, let alone to strengthen local services as we recover from COVID. The government doesn't, simply doesn't understand the huge hit local authorities uh, have suffered in their finances over the past few months, or the enormous strain they were under before, quite frankly. 
And it's not just on funding that the government is letting local authorities down. Far too often, government seems to have forgotten them altogether. Just look at what we've seen in Leicester. When the council wasn't even given the full testing data until a week after the health secretary announced Leicester was a surge area. Since then, the government seems to have been treated local council leaders in Leicester as opponents to blame for the lockdown rather than as partners to help implement it. This government's obsession with centralization, their quest to hoard power for themselves, is a big part of why their response to this pandemic has been frankly shambolic. As Ruth said, I've called for an independent public inquiry into this government's handling of this crisis. And when the government eventually relents and sets one up as it must, I will urge that inquiry to look specifically at Whitehall's failure to value the role you've played and Minister's failure properly to support you and the work that you've done and to work with you. The truth is local leaders should have been part of the government decision making since the very beginning of the crisis, as the Liberal Democrats have been calling for all along. Local government leaders should have been round the virtual table with ministers and public health officials from the start, feeding in their local expertise and concerns and taking shared responsibilities for implementing the measures needed to keep our communities safe. You should have been kept up to date with all the local data on cases and tests so that you could identify local surges and take action to stop them instead of being kept so often in the dark, waiting for ministers in Whitehall to swoop in and save the day. I just, it's just so damaging, especially in a crisis like this, to have a government that thinks of local authorities at best as an irrelevance and at worst an impediment. That is just not acceptable. And the government must not make the same mistake of discounting and ignoring local government as we set about recovering from this crisis. Because local government has an absolutely central role to play in making sure the country we build post-COVID is greener, fairer, and more equal than before. We've all known for decades that our country is too unequal. The huge gaps between rich and poor, men and women, black and white, the Southeast and everywhere else. These gaps have been far too big for far too long. Coronavirus has highlighted those inequalities and deepened them. Women and people from BAME backgrounds have been more likely to lose their jobs or see their income slashed. Those struggling to make ends meet before the pandemic have fallen further behind on bills and too many are now trapped in debt from which they can see no escape. And most telling of all, deprived areas and BAME communities have seen higher death rates than richer, whiter places. The government must ensure recovery doesn't enrich such inequalities, entrench such inequalities even more but instead actively and effectively work to reduce inequality. And the recovery must not undermine the fight against climate change. It must strengthen it. I tell you frankly, this may be our last best chance to transition our economy to net zero carbon fast enough. Surely the sheer cost of failing to prepare for the predicted risk of the pandemic crisis should be a dramatic wake up call to prepare properly now for the predicted risk of a climate crisis. But the reality is the Conservative government's climate policy has been lamentable these last five years. We are nowhere near on target to cut our greenhouse gas emissions quickly enough. Yet if we truly integrate economic policy with climate policy, we could make rapid progress that we need for our planet and we could rebuild our economy and get people back to work. But it requires nothing less than a green revolution. That's why I called on the government to invest 150 billion pounds, 150, not the 5 billion Johnson promised last week, 150 over the next three years on a green recovery plan, on insulating homes, on green transport, on renewable energy, on restoring lost biodiversity. Much of this will be best delivered by you, by local government, creating new community renewable energy pro projects so residents can get cheap, green, local electricity. New bus routes, cleaner buses, walking and cycling as a first choice transport op option. 
clean air zones to cut vehicle emissions, combat air pollution, and protect our children's lungs. Planting trees and restoring a natural environment, taking carbon out of the atmosphere, reversing biodiversity loss, enabling everyone to enjoy the huge health benefits of green open spaces. And embarking on a massive programme, a massive programme of home insulation to upgrade the energy efficiency of every home to at least band B energy performance certificates by 2030. Starting with all low income homes done by 2025, so we eradicate fuel poverty faster than planned. This is hugely ambitious, but such a massive homes upgrade would by itself rapidly create hundreds of thousands of good paying green jobs in every part of the country, not just in London, not just in the southeast, not just in a handful of big cities, but in every part of the country. Exactly what we need to prevent mass unemployment as we emerge from the pandemic, to deliver on green jobs and training guaranteed for our young people. Together, this green recovery plan could finally put us on the path to net zero. But this plan requires local authorities to be fully empowered to play your part, with central government giving you the funding and the powers you need to bring about a green revolution in your community. That's why today I'm calling on the government to provide £45 billion of green recovery investment over the next three years directly to local authorities to fund home insulation programmes, new bus and cycle routes, light rail and tram lines, tree planting and nature restoration, community energy projects, electric vehicle charging infrastructure and other projects to cut emissions and create green jobs in your community. And the government must match that huge level of extra funding with the extra powers you need, powers to regulate and commission local bus services, to invest in tram networks, greater powers to make walking and cycling easier and safer, powers to fast track the rollout of electric vehicle charging infrastructure, greater powers over housing and planning, including the power to ensure new housing developments must include access to high quality public transport, and powers to introduce ultra low emission zones that accelerate the shift to electric vehicles. For too long, government has paid lip service to the vital role of local authorities in tackling the climate emergency, and they failed to match their words with action. Nevertheless, I'm proud that Liberal Democrat councils across the country have taken it upon themselves to act. In Chelmsford, you've planted 13,000 trees as part of a programme to plant one tree for every resident in the district over 10 years. In York, you've launched a brilliant and bold anti litter campaign with a slogan, don't be a tosser. And in Sutton, you built the UK's first ultra low energy passive house secondary school. Fantastic. But I want the government to enable you to do even more. With the new powers for councils I'm proposing and the 45 billion pounds of new green funding for councils, you will be able to take a real lead in the fight against climate change. A devolution revolution to drive the green revolution. And it's not just on climate change where the government needs to start matching warm words about local government with real power and hard cash. On a whole range of issues, this government expects more and more from local authorities while giving you less and less. Handing councils responsibility for some of the toughest challenges what, without also handing over the power or funding you need to tackle them. Creating ever more statutory duties to prevent homelessness, provide accommodation for survivors of domestic abuse, or implement a public health approach to serious violence while simultaneously cutting your funding. Ministers announce new headline grabbing pots of money that turn out to be small pots and pots you don't get unless you bid and get lucky. We need to campaign for the stronger local democracy other countries take for granted. Local authorities need a long term sustainable funding settlement and they need to be given much greater control over how they raise the money to serve their communities. And nowhere, nowhere is his attitude more evident than in social care. Caring for the elderly, the disabled, the mentally ill, the vulnerable 
it's a fundamental duty of government. It speaks directly to who we are as a country and the caring society we want to build. It's something I care deeply about myself, having spent much of my own life as a carer. First for my mum during her long battle with bone cancer, then for my nana when she was frail and elderly, and now for my disabled son, John. So caring is something I care about. And this government's tragic failure to protect properly care home residents and social care staff from coronavirus makes me deeply angry. And it's yet another example of how far too many politicians in Westminster think care is just an afterthought. But as someone who has to care for my dis disabled son every day, care for me is my first thought. I know the frustration so many councillors have that they can't provide the level of care they know is needed because of how drastically the government is underfunding social care. A one billion shortfall for adult social care this year set to rise to four billion by 2025. It didn't have to be this way. But the Conservatives ripped up the cross-party agreement on social care funding, carefully stitched together through the Deal Not Commission and the CARE Act when the Liberal Democrats were in government. As a result, more than a, a million people are missing out on the care they need and would have had. So all too often, people left stranded in hospital after they finished their treatment because the follow-up care and support they need to go home is simply not available. So the immediate gap in social care funding must be plugged now. Governments must work with all parties and especially with local government to build a sustainable future for social care services across our country. So fixing the crisis in social care, tackling the climate emergency, addressing deep seated inequalities in our society, rebuilding our economy after the coronavirus pandemic. These are enormous challenges. It will take ambition, determination and innovation. But they can't be solved by a new announcement from the government, a new piece of legislation in Parliament, a new set of guidelines from Whitehall, important though they might be. They can only be solved if local authorities are empowered through devolution of funding and devolution of power and control to make the decisions and implement the changes that your communities need. That's something the Liberal Democrats have been fighting for throughout our history. It's part of our DNA and we will not give up that fight. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for recognising the, the vital role that local government always played, but has particularly been playing during this crisis. Um, and thank you also for recognising that local really does work best. I could give all sorts of examples where um, centralised proposals and procedures have actually worked far better when local areas have taken over. PPE is just one example. Um, so it won't surprise you to hear that we've got a lot of questions about local powers and devolution. What I'm going to do, um, Ed, is group some of the questions together, take three at a time if that's all right, and that will give yeah. you an opportunity to have a think about them. Um, and there are some really big issues here. So the first, um, you won't be surprised, is actually about devolution. And as you say, it's something that's Liberal Democrats, we've always advocated that local areas know best um, what is best for their area and that power and decision making should be devolved as close as possible to the people who are affected by those decisions. So a couple of linked questions. Um, what powers do you think should be devolved to local councils now and potentially through devolution? And linked to that, a second question, do you think that now is a good time to reorganise local government with the creation of county unitaries? Second question about homelessness, a um, question coming from Somerset West and Taunton Council, where we run the council, um, and they say quite rightly, we've had huge success locally during the crisis in our provision to homeless people through a multi-agency approach with drug, alcohol and mental health support. As we all know, it's not just about accommodation, it's about the wraparound services as well. What are your views as to how we support rough sleepers and homeless people moving forward? Um, and the third question is about the voluntary and community sector, which you've already spoken about passionately. Um, are Liberal Democrats going to champion the cause of third sector partners who do so much alongside local councils to help provide services? They've lost their sources of income and some in the charity sector might disappear with dire consequences 
to the communities they serve. So three questions there, three big issues, Ed, over to you. Yeah. Um, on devolution, um, let me take the first, second part of that first. Is now a good time to reorganise local government? Absolutely not. You know, we're in a crisis. We've got to pull together. Pandemic isn't over. We've got an economic crisis. We've got all the other challenges, Brexit and climate change. You know, why throw up the cards now? Um, I can't see that it's a sensible move. Um, one can debate the rights and wrongs of unitaries. Um, I have, I'm always a bit suspicious when people are bringing power together, but you know, I, I'm not I don't know, ideologically against them, but I, but I just think now is absolutely not the time. In, fact, in terms of powers being devolved, well, um, I think there's a whole menu of powers that could come down. In a way, I'd like local government to lead on deciding which powers it wants. I mean, we've talked about in Liberal Democrat policy of local authorities being able to choose which powers they want to get down so they're ready for them and they feel they're, those powers are the ones they need. Um, I don't want to dodge the question, though, and just say it's, it's up to local government to choose. The ones I would like to choose uh, would start with funding. Uh, we've got to find ways of ensuring that we're not the most fiscally centralised country in the world, and we need to, or at least in, 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 in uh, Western democracies, and we need to learn lessons from those democracies which have really been able to devolve financial power and responsibility. Um, but I think there are issues around planning. I mean, the, uh, some of the ways that planning has been centralised in recent years, I think, is wrong. The government just, get it, get, just seemed not to know the evidence. Local authorities uh, allow nine out of ten applications through. There are a million homes that have been given planning permission that haven't been built. Um, and, you know, the government's response is to say, well, we'll take more powers from you, rather than giving you more powers to deal with those people and developers who haven't moved. So the government just doesn't seem to understand what's happening in our communities. And that's one of the reasons why we need to think as many powers as possible as, as to, to, to devolve. I mean, the other one for me, uh, I've mentioned environment in my speech, the other one for me would be education. Um, I just think you need uh, accountability at the local level for education. I think some of the things that have happened, things like uh, with the free schools and the, the inability of local authorities to be the lead in school place planning, just one example. I'd want to go further, but you know, We've had real problems in Kingston, I don't know about you and your councils, where, um, you know, some quango deciding where the, school, where the school's going to go. They bought a place, it's completely inappropriate. They've obviously bought it without going to look at it. And they've wasted millions of pounds, millions of pounds, because they have a centralised approach to school place planning. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot that I'd like to devolve, but I'd like to engage with local government. So we, we got it right and we got the timing of it right. Um, homelessness. Um, huge issue for me um i meant i don't know if i mentioned i don't think i did um i met my wife emily uh on a liberal democrat housing policy working group in 2003 now you might think i'm a bit sad and i should get out more uh but emily has uh is a lawyer she's a housing lawyer she specialized in social housing she's worked for housing authorities she's trained council housing officers around the country and she's a counselor now here in kingston She's our housing portfolio holder. So you won't be surprised to know that we talk about housing a lot. And um, she uh, took a labour ward in, in Norberton, central Kingston, where we've got our, our largest density of social housing. And she uh, put a vote on regeneration to the residents and tenants, which the Tories weren't going to do. There was an 86% turnout, a 73% yes to the Liberal Democrat plans of much better council housing, more council housing, council housing that will be net zero carbon. Um, so, you know, we've got very, very ambitious plans for housing and that relates directly to homelessness and how we are going to ensure that homeless people get properly housed. Um, and that's by building more social housing. Um, and uh, Emily's committed to that. She's actually on a call uh, this afternoon um, with Kingston housing officers to look at what we're going to do about rough sleepers uh, and uh, make sure that now people are going to leave the hotels where they were accommodated during the uh, the worst of the pandemic that they don't go back on the streets and she's working with the council officers with local voluntary organizations like Kingston Church's Action on Homelessness 
to put together a package. And I guess that's my answer to the question. You need uh, strong local government leaders working with the local voluntary sector, properly funded, so that they can find solutions. You know, we need on we need to have lots of move on accommodation, um, and you may have to purchase that initially in the private sector or by being creative and innovative. But ultimately, we need to build, um, and um, you know, there is a chance to get this right. Um, I, it was actually an idea from Emily that I've got a piece of legislation which um, is uh, it's not on the statute books. I've tried to get it on there, and I'm not going to give up. And it's about homeless people who are terminally ill. And uh, if you're terminally ill and homeless at the moment, and you originally found intentionally homeless, that awful word from the 1996 Act, um, you have no rights to housing, even though you're dying. I just think that's an abomination. I think it's just disgusting. And my piece of legislation, which I worked up with St Mungo's, with um, Shelter and others, um, and Hospices UK is designed to make sure that we give powers to councils so that they uh, can look after people who are terminally ill. They've got the legal right to do that and the legal right, the requirement from the health service to step up to the plate um, so they can provide uh, housing for people who are terminally ill. But of course, ultimately, we don't want anyone on the streets. That's what we want. And hopefully this is a moment when we can do that. Sorry to go along that, but it's uh, a passion of mine. The voluntary is critical to every community and you know if we don't fund them if they're not supported we're going to lose so much I mean so much and the challenge will go back to councils and you know councils are fantastic but they have all the statute duties to do and they sometimes they need the voluntary sector to help in the statute duties and other times the things that they aren't able to do because they're so focused on what they legally are required to do there are bits and pieces what they really want to do but but actually the voluntary sector can come in and help and can work with the council. So a strong voluntary sector, properly funded, properly supported, I think is critical. And I know, you know, lots of Liberal Democrat councils uh, value their voluntary sectors as absolutely key. Um, I like to think we do. Um, I, I tell this little tale um, uh, about how I see the voluntary sector more broadly. Um, when I lost my seat in 2015 and was out of Parliament for two years, I spent most of my time on environmental stuff and renewable energy. And I ended up becoming the chair of a little uh, network. It's not a properly constituted, it's actually part of it. It's actually was based in the National Trust. Um, uh, but it had about 100 members, mainly charities, one or two local authorities, one or two um, uh, public bodies like the Crown, the state and, and so on. And what it was, was a, a, a voluntary network called Fit for the Future. Fit for the Future. You can go and look it up. I'm no longer the check, uh, having got re-elected, but I'm, I still sort of get the papers as a, as a sort of non-active board member. And what we did with Fit for the Future was we supported charities in the voluntary sector in preparing for climate change. Because, you know, charities, and we had people like RSPB on it, and we had small local charities, and they didn't have the, the know-how and the wherewithal to, to tackle climate change. And what we were trying to do was to give them the support through webinars, through uh, see and tell uh, um, visits, through email chat groups, a whole range of things to support the, the voluntary sector as they went about their business, but also started preparing for climate change. So I tell you that story because I think we have to find smart ways to support the voluntary sector, to do what they uh, want to do, their core objectives, but also to for them to be part of these very urgent wider societal objectives. Thank you for that, Ed. It's one of three really huge areas that we need to talk about. And certainly I know I speak for many uh, council leaders when I say one of the things we find really difficult, we struggle with, um, with the government, with our funding settlements, is the short termism. Yeah. The fact that we are virtually lurching from one hand out to the next. It's particularly true during this crisis. You could argue that's inevitable because of the crisis. But it is a fact that we are 
constantly having to compete against other local authorities in our regional areas in order to get the funding that we so desperately need. We need a long-term sustainable uh, settlement so that we can work together and provide long-term solutions, which is something that local government is really good at. Thank Ruth, you Ruth, Ruth, sorry to interrupt you there. Um, I, I thought they said they would uh, pay for all your bills. Didn't they say that at the end of the crisis? That's a very good point, Ed. I was actually spend, in the spend what you like. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we told, talk about reneging on a promise. That's outrageous that they did that. Outrageous. We were told to do what it takes um, and that they would be there. Um, and now it turns out it's not quite the way it was stated at the beginning. Yeah, excuse my sense of cynicism, but yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, let's take a couple more questions. One um, question is about the tourism and hospitality industry. Um, there are many parts of the country, some of the most beautiful parts of the country where Liberal Democrats are running the council. And so I'm not surprised there's a question here from Torbay in this case, um, saying that we desperately need a bespoke furlough scheme for areas like Torbay and there are many others where there's a significant dependency on the tourism and hospitality industry. Do you think the government will launch such a scheme for our tourism and leisure dependent communities? And obviously you'll have seen in the headlines, Ed, recently, some of the pressures on our coastal areas, but also on some of our beautiful cities, York, Bath, just to name two. So it's a really important issue. Um, and then a question about mental health. With mental health services overstretched already, what action do you think the government should take to accommodate the massive surge in need that's been seen as a result of the pandemic? Let's take those two. Yeah. Um, well, on tourism and hospitality, there does need to be a bespoke scheme, uh, probably based on furlough, but probably more as well. Um, we saw um, uh, yesterday, was it, or Sunday, um, that Oliver Dowden, the culture secretary, produced um, quite a good package, which is not perfect, but quite a good package for the arts and the cultural sector, which needed it. And, you know, um, we've Daisy Cooper, our amazing DCMS spoke, has uh, welcomed that, um, but pointed out some of its uh, failings. Um, but if they can do that for the cultural and arts sector, they must do it for tourism and hospitality, which has huge numbers of people in it. And like the cultural and arts, is particularly badly affected because it's more tricky to open up. Uh, and can be quite risky to open up and the sorts of measures that you know restaurateurs hoteliers and, and everyone involved in the uh hospitality and tourism sector uh, there are a lot of costs involved um they won't be able to earn the same amount of money there'll probably be less demand they won't be able to have as many covers in restaurants for example as before so there must be a bespoke deal for them that it's not like so many other sectors which are going back quite well, where people can work, work from home. You, you know, you can't serve in tourism and hospitality from home, can you? Um, so there has to be a special deal. Um, I'm going to actually say something you might be surprised. At. I think the furlough scheme overall was really good. Um, uh, and quite a smart move. It had a few wrinkles, of course, um, and the self-employed scheme had many wrinkles, but it was a good scheme. But um, as people go back, it's got to be changed, but one's got to be targeted now. It was previously universal, now it's got to be targeted, and tourism and hospitality must be one of the top, top uh, candidates for a special scheme, and urgently. Um, on mental health, I mean, mental health, so despite all the amazing work of Norman Lamb uh, and other Liberal Democrats, um, mental health has, in the recent years, been very poorly funded. Um, it's the reason why we're absolutely right to argue for tax rises and the penny on income tax for NHS and social care to make sure that priority areas like mental health do get more money. Um, and we should be arguing that now. It's our policy. We should be arguing for it. Um, and in my area, and I don't know how widespread this, but I have a sense that it's quite widespread. Um, children and adolescent mental health services are particularly poorly funded. The waiting lists I see for some constituents who I'm obviously trying to help them, um, they're just appalling. And it, it just breaks your heart. You, it's obvious you intervene early for young people, right? <laughs> you don't allow their mental health to deteriorate because that then affects the whole of their lives. It's just crazy. We are not intervening early. 
and I particularly focus on young people because there is some very disturbing evidence that the people who've been most affected by the lockdown and the pandemic have been young people. And we, we've got to act now. It's not, it's not something you can put off for six months or a year, it's now. And there needs to be a concerted package, yes, funded, supporting the, the counsellors and the, the therapists who are going to be needed. Um, and it's got to be a, a massive effort. And I see very little from the government on it. Um, Manira Wilson, our health and social care spokesman, the new MP for Twickenham, she's been amazing on it. Um, I launched a package early on in the uh, pandemic around Easter for NHS and social care staff. So they're probably protected, got tested, probably uh, recompensed and so on. And the second stage of that uh, campaign was taken on by Manira, focusing on mental health. So uh, it's an issue we've been talking about during this pandemic. And I think we've got to, to talk an awful lot more, out, particularly with respect to young people. And on that point, Ed, thank you for raising that because we have another question and I think it's worth looking at um, about young people and their mental health. One of our councillors saying that they hosted a webinar yesterday with young people about their experiences during lockdown and that mental health was raised as a worry uh, by all the panellists. So I think it'd be good to carry on having this conversation. What more can be done to help, to help including funding CAMs and other agencies as this mental health crisis grows? Because as you say, it's absolutely having an impact on all of us, particularly on young people. Um, an interesting thought going back to homelessness from someone else, um, as the number of university students drop this year, is there an opportunity to utilise some of the student accommodation for single homeless and rough sleepers? I know that you have a big university and a college in your constituency, so I thought that was an interesting suggestion yeah. we want to take away and have a think about. Um, and then from Peter Taylor, our elected mayor in Watford, how can we get better at making sure that our councillors and candidates reflect the diversity of the communities that they represent? You touched on that in your opening speech, and I think it's a really important issue. So if you'd like to take up those points, Ed. Well, let's start with the student accommodation. Um, you're right, um, Ruth, we have uh, quite a big university and the college. Um, the university has also been downsizing ahead of the pandemic, actually. Um, and the, some of the student accommodation, which was built by private developers, quite speculatively, isn't going to be used. And um, there is a chance and um, and Emily and I have already been talking about it, but uh, there's quite a lot of it we're doing at the moment uh, and she's doing at the moment uh, locally uh, on homelessness. But there may be a chance that we could use some of that accommodation. I think it's a really good point. Um, I know of several blocks that were um, speculatively built, which have looked to me as if they're empty. So I will pass that point on and I'd urge others to have a look at it in their communities. Um, Peter's um, excellent question. I, I just couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I, to say shame, maybe you think it's too, too strong, but we've not done a good job, friends, on diversity. We're getting a lot better on gender diversity. That is true. Um, it's amazing we've got so many brilliant women leaders in local government. In Kingston, I'm delighted our council has more women councillors than men. And of the leadership team, um, they're, the vast majority are women. So um, that's good. And we've now got, for the first time ever, more female MPs than male MPs, which is really good. It's surely changed the atmosphere in the party party. And um, I think it's Joe's uh, legacy. I think we should pay tribute to Joe for what she achieved. Um, but A, we can't be complacent on gender, but on other areas of diversity, we're not doing anywhere near as well, particularly black and ethnic minority. I'd also add disability actually and in some places at LGBT plus. But, but let me focus on black and ethnic minority, if you don't mind, particularly in the wake of Black Lives Matter. The Tories are doing better than us. The Labour Party is doing better than us. We have got to sort this out at all levels of the party. It is just not good enough. We have to look like Britain. We don't deserve to look like, to do well if we don't look like Britain. And we won't do well if we look like it. If we want to win, I want to put our values into practice. We all have collectively, my friends, we've got to take this issue seriously. I don't know how many of you have read the Older Dice Review in 2018. It was reviewing all the efforts we made over the years that, that have failed. 
And the old advice of you and this issue says, you've got to change the culture. And to change the culture, that's every single member, particularly leaders like you and me. It's our responsibility. Yes, as a, if I become the leader, it'll be my obsession. Be warned. I've said on one of these things, in a few years' time, if I haven't sorted it, I'll resign. That's how important I think it is. And I think we really need to sort this out. General election review points to it. Um, in my own constituency, I represent quite a diverse community. Um, probably of the 11 MPs now, um, the most diverse. Simon, obviously, Simon Hughes used to have a very diverse constituency. We've now probably got nearly 30% black and Asian minority diversity. Uh, the, bi the biggest groups are Tamils from Sri Lanka, uh, Gujaratis uh, from India. We've got the largest population of Koreans in Europe. Um, we've got a mosque uh, with um, the Muslim population mainly heralding from Pakistan, but also from Iraq and Iran and now Syria. Um, I helped the Sikh population get a Gurdwara a few uh, years ago. They're mainly from uh, East Africa uh, and increasingly asylum seekers uh, from Afghanistan primarily. Um, and there are many other communities actually. So it's pretty diverse. And what's that meant for me as a local constituency MP? I've, I, I love engaging with these communities. It's one of the nicest things about being a local MP, uh, uh, not just because I like curry and, and Asian food, um, but um, you know, you go to their religious ceremonies, you go to their schools. You know, on a Saturday morning in Kingston, there's a Tamil school, a Hebrew school, an Arabic school, a Korean school, an Urdu school, a Hindu school. You know, it, it, it's amazing, it's wonderful. And um, I've made it my uh, job over 20 years now to engage. And what, what I've tried to do is ensure that those uh, communities are join our party. So we have a very high proportion of local party members from those black and ethnic minority communities in my constituency. Not enough, but we've really grown it. Eight of our 38 councillors on Kingston Council are from black and ethnic minority uh, backgrounds. So um, I think we've made some effort. It's been hard work and taken a long time, but we've now got to do that across the country. Some, some local parties have done it well. Uh, I'm sure Watford um, has done pretty well with Peter and Dorothy and Ian and others. Um, but uh, Peter, I'd be interested in, in your comments either, I'm not sure if you're able to come on the stage or, or, or maybe email me or maybe chat later um, if you've got views but for me this is probably one of the biggest challenges internally that we face and we have to get it right and soon. Thank you Ed. Um, you talked about the Green Revolution and Green Recovery Plan so you'll be pleased to see we have a question about cycling and walking. Um, the question is throughout lockdown um, we've moved cycling and walking infrastructure forward. What can we do to help public transport um, which is relied on by some people who can't easily cycle or walk whether through age or other limitations? How can we make sure that public transport gets back on its feet again? Um, and then linked to that any thoughts about rural bus services? Do they just need more money or is local regulation part of the answer and then um, a lovely interesting question from our leader in Bath and North Air, Somerset Ed when will being a councillor be recognised as an actual job or vocation rather than a hobby I feel your pain um, Ed if you'd like to take those two that'd be great okay well let's do transport first um, yes yeah, be, it has been one of the the plus side, seeing cycling and walking um, and um, really take off and, and become a priority. I think that we should be complacent though. We've got a lot more to do on that. And now's an opportunity to really you know, fast track it, if you like. So cycling, walking becomes you know, the first option for people in transport. And I don't if you remember Don Foster a few years ago, he, he had a piece of legislation which enabled uh, people to have local travel plans so you can engage with people about the best way to do their travel and often it was cycling and walking and they hadn't realized so we really need to be very proactive in cycling and walking and being imaginative and I, I dust down some of Don Foster's excellent work on this um, but on public transport it, it is challenging um, people are worried about traveling on public transport and that's understandable um, clearly the face masks issue is, is being tackled and um, hopefully confidence will come back um, I mean, frankly, until we get a vaccine, 
and hopefully that's not too far away hopefully it's sometime next year hopefully the first half of next year until we get a vaccine i think um it's going to be difficult for public transport and it's going to have to get some transitional funding to keep it going frankly until we get a vaccine um i'm sure there are confidence building measures that we can what can be applied um and, and it's not an area that I've sort of studied or talked to experts about. It's, a, it, it's just so challenging. Um, and I think we just need some, hopefully some evidence that can be given a degree of publicity to encourage people onto public transport. Because the problem we're seeing, as you'll be aware, is probably behind this question, and we've seen it in other countries, particularly China actually, is that people have, piled off public uh, public transport into their cars some are walking and, and, and cycling but we're seeing more car car usage going up it's offset a little bit by people working at home we know that through through zoom etc um but it's challenging um and inevitably there's going to be local circumstances um that um will detect which is the what, what is the best solution um but i'd, I'd almost throw it back ruth i i don't have all the answers on this one and i'd be interested if, if uh, the lga you know, cross party has got some views on the best way forward um there was a little question about rural transport really important one actually and uh, i felt that um i felt for a long time that we need to re-regulate buses um you know if you look where re regulation has been kept in places like london over a period of years, bus ridership has gone up because the local authority, in this case the GLA, has been able to you know, take broader considerations in to account um, where you know, a, a private bus operator won't. And by tendering and, and overseeing it, um, they've been able to ensure that buses were there for people who needed them. And I would like to see bus re-regulation uh, as a massive option in transport policy. Um, and I think rural areas, it would be particularly helpful. Um, I'm not saying it's a panacea, but I think it would enable um, the local authority to take into account all the different social, environmental and economic issues, which the private operator just doesn't. So I am completely on board for that one. Um, when will a, 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 a councillor role uh, not be seen as a hobby well you've got to remember i'm married to a counselor uh if i think if i told her it was a hobby <laughs> i'm not sure if that would go down well for the marital relationship she works extraordinarily hard i i see how counselors uh, work hard and obviously i've worked over many years with counselors uh, uh some of my best friends in the liberal democrats are counselors um and you know i'm sure it's a, for all parties you know all political parties Councillors, you know, try their best, and um, they they deserve much greater recognition, frankly. And, and it actually takes us back to the devolution agenda. Um, I think one of the things about the devolution agenda done properly is it says to people, local government is a really important part of our society. It's a critical part of our society, and people who work in it, councillors, council officers, should be valued. And they've been denigrated by uh, the press for so long. National government has used it as a, uh, as a kick, you know, to kick, uh, and it's just disgraceful. Uh, and um, it creates a image about councils and councillors and council officers, which is just not true. Um, this might be, you might think it's very odd for me to mention this, but um, those in the Liberal Democrats uh, who are listening will remember a book, it was called The Orange Book. Um, and it was seen, uh, and still is seen wrongly in my view, as a book that moved the party a bit more to, to the right. Um, I urge people to read it, and particularly my chapter, because my chapter in the Orange Book is on local government. And I would be very surprised if you read my chapter on local government and think, oh, that's right wing, because <laughs> it isn't. It's liberal, it's reformist. It's about a very different approach to local government than we've seen in recent years. Uh, and it, 
it, it the aim of my of my chapter is to champion local democracy, and if we did that, I think the role of local councillor would have the the status it should have. Thanks, Ed. And I'm really pleased we're covering a lot of ground, comparing this webinar to the, the previous two with two different parties. We seem to be getting through a lot more questions, and that's thanks to you giving very concise answers. So I'm grateful to you. Two more. One about education. You did speak earlier um, about the, the impact of free schools on school um, on place planning um, and on the education sector generally its relationship with local government so a question on education in the longer term would you like to bring academies and free schools back under local authority control and then a question about funding ed um, you've said quite rightly that we need a lot more funding in the local government area we need a lot more funding for mental health we need a lot more funding to carry on the really good work we're doing with homelessness but also to provide those essential services in adult social care and children's um, so the question is how would you fund it where would the extra money come from so let's take those two questions um on education um well i'm not very keen on free schools at all um and i think that um this problem they create with place planning is just a disaster. I think they waste money uh, and uh, the idea that the local authority can't decide to build a community school is outrageous and the very first thing that we should do is to give back to local authorities the role of, of place planning and the ability to build local community schools owned, run and operated uh, under the local authority aegis. Uh, academies, it uh, 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 would be a second stage, I think, um, and I'm not against thinking about that um, at all. Um, the one thing we've got to try to, to uh, think through, and local authorities weren't allowed to do this, and it was a real missed opportunity, and one reason why I think there is a case for local authorities being more, more active in this area, having that freedom, is um, really getting um, networks of local schools, families of local schools. Sometimes it happens naturally because head teachers work really well and things like school forums um, and, uh, and they see themselves not necessarily competing but as, as part of a family. And, uh, and obviously particularly in secondary. And um, I think that model of local community secondary schools working in a network, supporting each other, um, so something I just like to see a lot more of because I think it would challenge some of the underlying uh, ideology behind uh, academies and you could give schools the chance of moving back into the local authority umbrella because you, they'd see that um, that was hugely advantage for, advantages for them and you see what the governments have done is they they've undermined local authorities role and then said, oh, local authorities aren't doing a good job, but you've just undermined their role, right? Um, and uh, they gave incentives. Uh, and so people took decisions about setting up academies, which weren't really based on quality of education or the needs of, of young people. Uh, they were based on ideology. Um, but you know, the sense that I have an ideology when it comes to this is that local schools need to work together. And it's, it's particularly secondary. You know, what, if we want a broader curriculum, Sometimes it's quite difficult, and I particularly think in rural areas, actually, where well, this is more challenging, but, but in other areas too, it's quite difficult for schools to really provide the breadth of the curriculum because it's impossible. Um, I particularly think in aspects of vocational education, but you could think about languages, you could think about another area, which you can't expect a school to have, be able to provide, you know, seven languages. I mean, some may, but the vast majority can't. And equally, the, the wide variety of vocational education, which we should be allowing uh, youngsters to, to choose from, you know, I think from the age of 14 at least, um, that's gonna, that would require quite a costly investment if schools weren't working together. So um, I guess that's my, my approach. And um, uh, I think we need to give local authorities the power to do that. And you know, I, I don't think the money that goes to schools should just be a pass through. I think local authorities need to be more engaged and be allowed to be more engaged and funded to be more engaged in what's happening in the schools. And certainly many of the, many of the head teachers I speak to would really welcome that. Um, funding, how would we fund all this stuff? Um, well, 
On social care, we've talked about a penny on income tax for education, higher taxes. And um, uh, when I became Treasury spokesman uh, after Joe became the leader, I, I costed the Liberal Democrat manifesto for December. Uh, I like to like the reports by the IFS, the Economist and the Resolution Foundation, which said it was the most progressive because we were doing the most for people on the lowest incomes, more than labour. Um, but it was also fiscally responsible because the numbers added up. Um, and they added up because we were putting taxes up. Um, the penny on income tax is the best known, but we were putting some environmental taxes up. We were closing some tax loopholes. We were ensuring that uh, wealthier people paid more tax. And so we were increasing the tax burden. And I think that's one of the ways you would look at it over time of funding this. But I'm going to say something which might surprise you and is a bit radical, but um, I'm going to claim I'm allowed to because I'm an economist. I've got my first degrees in economics. I did a master's in economics at night school and been involved in economic policy for the party for a long time. And it's about the debt that's been run up during COVID. Because I'm, I'm not worried about it. <laughs> I might seem pretty odd, but I'm not. And I, 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 we've got to push the government back on this. They can't use the debt from COVID as an excuse to cut public services and cut support to local government. We must not allow that. We must win this intellectual argument. Um, and my take is this, it's a bit unorthodox, but I think it's right. I think it mirrors what really happened after the Second World War when debt was, was uh, you know, went sky high. And this it is, it, this is it. With debt costs very low, servicing debt is as cheap as it's ever been. There's no problem in actually having some more debt. And most of the debt we have now, just like in the Second World War, is owed to the Bank of England. So if we make this debt a millstone round our neck and prevent us growing, um, that doesn't make sense because we owe the money to ourselves. So why would we stop ourselves growing, stop ourselves investing in public services um, just to pay back the money at the Bank of England? You know, this is not a magic monetary argument, by the way. I don't believe in that. The debt will have to be paid back, but it can be rolled over, just like war loans were rolled over. Um, if you don't, by the way, you get into a position where you know you are um, just printing money forever and never thinking about how you behave economically responsible. So I'm not, and this is not some sort of Corbynista type agenda, but it is an agenda which says you shouldn't allow the future of our young people, the future of local government, the future of public services to somehow be jeopardized because of COVID. That is exactly the wrong response. And it's even more the wrong response because we've got the challenge of climate change. We have to invest now, whether we like it or not, this is existential. So, um, you know, when people ask me, how would you fund all this? Well, there's definitely room for some, uh, some tax rises as described, but I would also say, that at the moment, it's a classic time when you can borrow and you shouldn't worry, worry about the fact that the national debt has risen a while. Thanks, Ed, that's really interesting. Um, we've just got time for one more question and it seems appropriate to pick up the point you've just made about climate change. Obviously, the whole experience of this pandemic um, has been and continues to be traumatic for many people, but there's also a lot of learning that's coming out. And um, look what happens to the issue of homelessness when you actually put the right amount of money to it and the will, the political will, um, to help people get off the streets. There's a lot of learning here, um, but particularly about environmental issues. We were all talking about climate change, putting up ambitious plans to think about how we can save our planet, improve air quality and make life better for everyone. It does feel like now is the opportunity to grab hold of that agenda again. And I wonder if you'd like to share a few thoughts about our learning from the crisis um, and what we can do going forward to ensure that we don't all get back in our cars again. Yeah, I think this is a really important point. I mean, we talked earlier about walking and cycling. Um, I think we should focus a little bit on the technology we're using now. Um, you know, I think Zoom and video conferencing uh, are something that have been around for ages. Liberal Democrats have argued about using them. And I'll be frank with you, I've hardly video conferenced ever. I've never Zoomed before COVID. Uh, and I think it's actually really significant. Uh, and it's particularly significant with respect to air travel. Um, 
you know, for four or five years, I was a management consultant back in uh, before I was elected. And we used to have this knack of turning, you know, rubbish PowerPoint slides into air, air, air tickets. We go around the world uh, meeting people, meeting clients, interviewing people uh, and um, traveling unnecessarily. And I generally think business uh, air travel, demand for, for, for business air travel should be dramatically reduced. I hope um, many companies will do that automatically. I like to think that we can find ways uh, of encouraging that so people don't fly all the time. And the reason I mentioned flying is I know the, the, the uh, airlines are having a tough time. We've got to think about uh, the workers. We need to transition, right? Um, when I was uh, camp minister for climate change, my chief scientist said that um, when I asked him what was the best thing I could do uh, personally to not make climate change worse, he said, don't fly. It was absolutely clear straight away. Dave Mackay, he's an amazing uh, scientist uh, and um, uh, he was really, really clear. So um, that is one of the things that I hope we can take from COVID. I think, by the way, here in South West London, the case for uh, a third runway at Heathrow is now gone. Uh, and I think, um, you know, local authorities who either own uh, airports or looking to expand them will need to think, think quite carefully about that. So I think that's one big part, Ruth, of lessons from, from COVID, this technology. I mean, I am looking forward not just to Zooming the whole day. <laughs> I'm looking forward to meeting people as well. Um, but it will reduce the demand for travel, in particular air, air travel. I'm sure there are other lessons as well. Um, I say there's one slightly depressing lesson. And that is that greenhouse gas emissions didn't fall even more. I mean, they did fall dramatically, that's true. They fell globally by about 8%, 9%. But if you look at the science, we've got to do a lot more globally than that to get things right. And, you know, we, everything stopped and they only went down by 9%. So there's a, there's a message there, which is a little bit challenging. And it shows the extent of what's got to happen. And if you set that aside, you know, we, we need the billion poorest in our world who don't have electricity, don't have cars, they live in rural Africa, rural Latin America, rural India, rural uh, Asia. We need them to prosper as well, right? Um, and we need them to prosper in a way that's climate friendly. So although you know, there are some good parts of, of COVID for climate change, lessons we can learn, I'm afraid one of the lessons that I take is we've got to be really radical. Um, this is a, an emergency. It's an emergency. As I said in my speech, you know, we knew a pandemic crisis could happen. It was on the National Risk Register and the government failed to prepare for it. One of their many failings in this, in this coronavirus crisis. Now they, they did this pandemic simulation in 2016, the Cygnus exercise. It told them what to do and they didn't do it. We now know, we know what climate change is gonna do, right? We've got all the science. We've had 30, 40 years of global conference on it. We know what's happening. We can see what's happening. Shame on us if we don't blimmin' well wake up and make this a, a, a top priority and change our economies, our transport, our housing, educate, everything has to change. And uh, it's, it's not a choice, we've got to do it. And, and for me, that means that, um, we have to confront people with the, with the reality that even during COVID, even during COVID, we weren't cutting greenhouse gas, gas emissions by enough. So I'm sorry if that's a bit depressing for you, Ruth, but it's, it's the fact. And we, we, you know, the green agenda that Liberal Democrats challenge, I know some other uh, parties are, are keen on, um, we've just got to get, we've got to get serious about this. Absolutely, Ed, and we all hear the passion um, that you give to the importance of this. Um, I'm afraid to say that's all we've got time for. So thank you, everyone who's put in their questions and participated in this webinar. But I'd particularly like to thank Ed for joining us today. Um, thank you for taking part and answering a wide range of questions 
um, and giving us a real sense of what you care about and what you stand for. I hope that everyone's found it interesting. I know I certainly have. And we do look forward to seeing everyone taking part in the other virtual webinars that we're holding during the rest of the week. Thank you once again to our sponsor, CCLA. Um, and for everyone taking part in this webinar, there is a very short survey that we're going to be sending. Please do complete it. We do value your feedback. We do learn from what you say um, and change the way we do things as a result. This is a very unusual conference, as we've all recognised. Um, I'm sure, like Ed, we're all hoping that soon we can get back to actually being in the same room together. We've learned a lot about how remote working works, but we've also learned that we are social beings and we, we like each other company. So it's great to have so many people taking part in the webinar but I most sincerely look forward to seeing you all again soon and Ed thank you for your time it's been absolutely fascinating and a pleasure to host you thank you thanks everyone thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of the day bye bye bye, bye. bye. bye.